Welcome everyone to our webinar, You Don't Know What You Don't Know. My name's Dan Hutchinson. I'm the Managing Director of Cook and & Hutchinson. And before I get into the actual um, part of the, the presentation that we, we're going to talk about here today, and that's, that's about looking after your business and really doing what we're very passionate about, and that's protecting and planning your business. I want to have a quick talk to you about what we do and what our expertise are for those that aren't uh, regular subscribers to our webinar, of which there are a few today. We deal with personal legal services, uh, commercial legal services, and our entire approach is aimed at proactive legal solutions for small to medium sized enterprises. Now we understand and we get that time is often tight and of the essence and we also get what it's like to be in small business, we're a small business ourselves. So what we've done probably in the last three to four months is we've decided that we're not lawyers that sell time to anyone anymore and we've burnt our timesheets. In burning our timesheets that means that we no longer have any hourly rates in our firm and that if you come and talk to us we can give you an agreed scope of work for an agreed price which provides certainty for you. It means that we can get the job done without looking at the clock and it means that you will get a far better result. So I wanted to share that with the, well, the new people that we've got and the old hats that have come back to listen to our next webinar. In relation to our commercial um, offerings, Really what we do is we deal with business transactions, uh, franchising agreements, commercial leases, licensing arrangements, commercial property advice and unfortunately there is commercial litigation and anything else in between. The terms business transactions and commercial property advice in particular are quite broad and this is obviously only a broad brush overview of what it is that we do, but in relation to all of those areas, they are all areas where you can get certainty of outcome and certainty of price and certainty of time of delivery from us and that's something that I don't think you can get from many other places. In relation to personal services, what we're talking about there are, are wills, your estate planning more broadly, estate administration, estate litigation and general litigation. Now when we talk about estate planning we're talking about things like binding death benefit nominations, enduring powers of attorney, advanced health directives in relation to all of those areas again including litigation you can get certainty of price you can get and certainty of delivery uh, within reason in relation to litigation for an agreed scope of work so that you know what your total legal spend will be. And I think that's pretty important as a business that you're able to budget what your expenses are going to be in any one year. That's what we're trying to do. The other thing that we're trying to do is prove that legal services don't have to be a grudge purchase. They can in fact be an investment for your business and can leave your business on a very strong footing. We believe that lawyers should be proactive and that we should be out there talking to our clients, doing what I'm doing now by webinar and telling you what it is you should be looking for in your business and what are the things that you don't know so that hopefully you can pick them up before it is too late. What I'm going to do today is show you how we are proactive and what I think you should be doing as business owners to make your business uh, far safer than it would be otherwise, how you can be proactive in your own business. Of course we have to have a disclaimer. What I'm going to do today is a broad brush overview of eight areas. So I haven't got a lot of time to stop on any one topic and I don't intend going into any great detail on any particular topic that we're going to cover today. 
Instead, this is supposed to be a broad brush overview so that you can get an idea of the types of things that you need to have a look at in your business. And if you need some assistance on a fixed price basis, you know that you can get in touch with us. You can also get in touch with your own lawyer about it. Certainly no obligation for you to come and talk to me or one of my colleagues here, although we're more than happy to talk to you, of course. So this is where we're going today. We're going to start with our goals and objectives. We'll then move on to your asset protection, talk about structuring of your business, talk about the elephant in the room, which is your employees, your employment, have a talk about your premises. So when I'm talking about structure, I'm not talking about the structure of your building, I'm talking about the structure of your business. Have a talk about your premises and the way in which you've got that secure, your suppliers, which obviously won't apply to everyone, your terms of trade, how are you engaging with your customers. And then we'll also talk about some personal issues, particularly where you've got more than one owner of the business that you might not otherwise be aware of. Now, this webinar is supposed to run for an hour. I hope to do slightly better than that for you so that everybody can go and get on with their day. I know what time of year it is. By my calculations, I've got approximately six and a bit minutes to talk about each area, so I'll emphasise again, this is just a broad brush overview. Now, talking about the goals and objectives for your business, we need to have a think about what phase your business is in. Are you a startup? Are you further along than startup? Are you at the point in time where you're trying to build your business into something that's going to be far larger than what it is? Or are you at the stage where you're really looking for an exit to get out of your business? Obviously, each of those phases and any of those in between are going to present different challenges and there are going to be different legal issues that arise as a result of the phase of the business that you're in. So I'm not pretending to be a business coach, I'm a lawyer. What I am telling you is that what phase you are in, in your business, will directly correspond with what your legal issues are. So if you don't know what phase your business is in or where it is going, then there's your first start. That's something where you really should be thinking about, okay, can I write down what my goals and objectives are for my business? Where am I now and where do I want to get to? At least if you can identify where you are now and where you want to go to, you're a chance at being able to unravel some of the other issues that we're going to speak about. When you're planning your goals, they should be reasonably specific goals. You need to know and be able to measure what your goals are. So you can't say that I want my business to be going well. Or what does well mean? Does that mean that you increase turnover from $500,000 to $950,000? And is there any point in increasing your turnover from 500000 to 950000 if your expenses also increase by the same $450,000? You then need to write your goals down. One of the things that we will ask when we do a review with a business is what are your goals and where are they written down? If you've written your goals down, at least you're somewhat committed to what those goals are and you're more likely to follow through on them. Now asking whether or not your staff know your goals. If your goal is that you want to make $500,000 profit in a year, you might not want your staff to know that. Your staff should, however, know what their production goals are, what their KPIs or key performance indicators are. If they don't know those things and they can't achieve their goals that you set for them or their 
targets that you set for them becomes then very difficult for you to achieve your goals. Now hopefully I'm starting to create a picture here about how these things will flow into one another. If your goal is to have five different uh, showrooms to sell a particular product throughout the country, then one of your staff staffing goals or the goals for your staff, your operations manager might be to go and look for five sites that are going to work and provide you with a report for that. But unless you know that you want to open the five sites throughout the country, you're going to have no idea that you need to set that target for your staff. So your goals and objectives feed specifically and, and quite directly into everything else that we talk about here. And what those goals and objectives are raise different uh, legal issues and legal issues of varying degrees. So moving through then, the next thing that we're talking about is asset protection. And the illustrations certainly help us there. That's what asset protection is all about. It is protecting the assets that you have and making sure that if your business goes bad, you don't lose your house. If your business goes bad, you don't necessarily lose your business premises. You need to have things structured in such a way that the assets that you have, be they your business, your home, if you've got multiple businesses, those things should be insulated from one another. If they're not, you can end up in a situation in which the entire kingdom comes tumbling down quite quickly. For instance, if business went bad for whatever reason, it might not be your fault. For instance, you might be in the mining game supplying services to BHP Billiton and you're a reasonably small supplier of a particular part that they put into their trucks or that they need serviced by their trucks. All of a sudden BHP decides that they're having a um, fight of some sort with the federal government and they stop production. The iron ore price crashes. Something external happens beyond your control and all of a sudden that income that you relied upon where your business had a turnover of $5 million a year supplying these parts and these different things to BHP, all of a sudden the bottom falls out of it and you don't have a business anymore. If your assets aren't properly protected, there's a very real risk that not only does your business go into bankruptcy, perhaps you go into bankruptcy, but also you may lose your house. Other things that might be beyond your control would be things like uh, if there's litigation. Everybody has had or does have at some point in time a client or a customer who is nothing short of a lunatic. Now if that lunatic client or customer decides to come back and is dissatisfied with what you've done and they find an equally, uh, shall I say, crazy uh, lawyer who wants to um, pursue you or agrees to pursue you and to litigate, then you may well find yourself coming to see me or somebody else, uh, whether at this firm or another, and having to deal with the very real risk of what could be an expensive lawsuit. If you haven't isolated and quarantined off your assets, that could spell absolute disaster for you. So in looking at your asset protection, you need to identify first what your at-risk assets are. So what are the assets that people could have a go at and what are my important assets? An important asset is the roof over your head. It's perhaps the machine that you need to um, conduct your business. What documents have you actually signed? 
So have you signed personal guarantees? Are you personally liable for the performance of your company and the contracts that you've entered into? And are your assets intermingled? That is, are you using the family trust that was set up by your cousin, the accountant, as your own personal bank account and pulling money out and putting it back as you please? Are you using your house as security for your business? It's not to say that those things can't happen, but if they happen in a more structured way and you're at least aware of your, we're aware of your risks, then those intermingled assets can, where possible, be separated out so that perhaps your business is owned in one entity and you, the property that you operate your business out of in another. There are a whole host of things that we can do, or any lawyer for that matter can do, to provide you with good protection uh, for your assets and to make sure that those at-risk assets that you've identified um, are as protected as they can be and that your exposure to risk is limited. It feeds in well then to a third area of structure. You need to understand what your current structure is both from a tax point of view and an asset protection point of view. If you're a straight company at the moment you're paying and you're a small business you're paying about 28 and a half or 29 cents in the dollar in tax. If you're a family trust, of course, you've got to make sure that you attend to your family trust declarations each year by 30 June about where all of your distributions are going to, otherwise you'll pay a penalty tax rate to the ATO. If you're a sole trader and you personally end up in trouble, then it's your house or whatever other assets you own in your own name that could be on the line. There are a whole a host of different reasons for you to change what your structure is or to at least review what your structure is and see if it's still appropriate to you. There's, there's small business uh, CGT rollover concessions available in certain circumstances up to about six million dollars. Unfortunately that doesn't stop the state government taking some stamp duty but you need to understand how your structure works and once you understand how it works, you need to think about whether or not that structure is still appropriate for you and your business. When you first start your business, a number of people will start that as a sole trader. And they may then, using the CGT small business concessions, roll that business over into a company structure or a trust structure with a corporate trustee, a unit trust or another structure. The point is that people understand that that is how that business operates. Now, if you're operating with more than one person, it's important that you have agreements in place. Whether they're a shareholders agreement, a partnership agreement, some other type of agreement where you've got a joint venture, joint venture agreement, you need to understand what the roles and responsibilities of each of the parties are in that structure to prevent problems occurring later on down the track. And then what happens if there's a dispute between those parties? How do we resolve it? Any decent agreement will have a dispute resolution clause included in it. That is the manner in which the parties to the agreement must conduct themselves to try and reach an amicable resolution before they resort to litigation. That's not necessarily something that happens before the lawyers are called in, but it is something that generally happens before uh, my more expensive colleagues at the bar, the barristers, are called in and you end up finding yourself in the Supreme Court District Court listening to what directions the barristers think should be put in place and the way in which the litigation is going to be conducted. It's probably at the point in time that there's a dispute 
that you really think that perhaps the agreement should have been in place, whether it was shareholders, partnership, joint venture or something else. And then finally in relation to your structure, you've worked out how you're getting into business, how are you getting out? That's critical. If you have no idea at all how you are going to get out of your business or how you might be able to sell your business, exit and be paid out by a partner, uh, create a, a board structure where you're going to be the chairman of directors and the rest of the directors are doing the work for you. Not all of us can be that lucky. But if you don't have an idea about how you're going to get out of your business, then you really start to or need to start thinking about that now. You can never start planning your exit too early because you don't know when the next opportunity might arise and that opportunity might not be in the business that you're in. And if you're not appropriately structured to be able to get out, you can trigger all sorts of different capital gains tax, uh, stamp duty and um, other issues where you might not be able to get out and pursue that next opportunity, whether that opportunity is retirement or another business. So we've spoken about our goals and objectives, our asset protection, our instruction. Now, a slight shift to our employment. Employees can be the source of the greatest satisfaction as a business owner, but equally can be the greatest source of frustration. If you're a sole trader, you can switch off for the next five minutes because you don't have employees, but perhaps you're going to employ some. Before you employ them, take this into account. Do you have employment agreements? Do they exist? If you do have employment agreements, when did you last look at them? What you need to do is you need to make sure that each and every employee in your business understands what their role in the business is. That comes back to your goals and objectives. You need to understand where you want to take your business and if you don't have your employment agreements reflecting what you want your staff to do, then if there is a dispute about what that staff member is to do, it is your word against theirs and that's something that we want to avoid. Not only do you need to have your agreements in place, they also need to be compliant with the Fair Work Act. Now, the Fair Work Act has been around in its various forms for a number of years. And I can tell you from bitter experience uh, for clients of ours who are all employers, that going to the Fair Work Commission is not something that you want to do as an employer. Although in this country there is a presumption of innocence, I suggest that if there is any room or any statement made at the Fair Work Commission in which the employees or the employers version of events can be preferred unless you have all of your T's crossed and all of your I's dotted, they will, or the Fair Work Commission will take the employee's word over the employers. And that's 99 times out of 100 that that will happen in my opinion in any event. You then need to work out whether or not as a part of your agreements being compliant, whether or not their casual or permanent employees, that's particularly important. If you don't know what they are, then I suggest that they're going to be part-time permanent employees, notwithstanding the fact that you pay them an hourly rate. That obviously then gives those employees access to various remedies under the Fair Work Act that they might not otherwise be able to or entitled to I take advantage of as a casual employee. 
you should also know whether or not your employees are employees of yours or sub independent or subcontractors. We have a checklist um, on our website in our blog about whether or not your employees are really employees or whether or not they're subcontractors or independent contractors. That's worth having a look at if you're uncertain, certainly as a starting point at least. I'm not saying that all employees are bad, in fact the employees that I have here of 12 staff are all brilliant. You do from time to time however have a bad egg. When you have that bad egg you do want to make sure that you're able to manage them out appropriately and that your employment agreement covers off on performance management, the warnings that they're going to get, the processes that they will go through, what you expect of them. If your employment contracts don't cover those things and don't cover other basic things like what their role is, who they report to and what their wage is, what your hours of operation are and those sorts of things, then really you're going to be up against it then if you're trying to either uh, remove an employee because of a downturn or remove an employee because they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Moving then through to our next section which talks about your premises. Now I've already touched on that briefly in relation to structuring. But the message there, explore the premises, is pretty key. Don't lease something because a real estate agent says that it looks good. Don't lease something because your mate down the road says, yeah, look, it's going to be great for your business. Go and explore it. Anyone listening to this really should go now and have a look to find out whether or not their tenancy is secure. Do you have a lease? If you have a lease, is it registered? That is, is it registered with the Department of Environment and Resource Management, that is the Titles Office? Is it required to be registered? If your term is less than three years, it doesn't have to be. You might have a retail shop lease that you're with um, Westfield or another shopping centre or even a smaller centre where there's three or four shops. You might also be a tenant from month to month. That means if you're a tenant from month to month that the landlord can give you one month's notice and you're out. You should understand your lease and what your rights and obligations are. Obviously you have an obligation to pay rent but for that rent you're also entitled to the um, quiet enjoyment of your premises and to be able to operate your business from it. So while you need to be aware of your rights, you also need to be aware of your other obligations that you might have. For instance, if you're trying to move shop, do you need to repair and make good? And what does that mean? All of those things will turn on what the terms of your actual lease are. So if you haven't had a look at it for a while and you're doing your planning, that's something that you need to pull out and have a look. There may be those of you saying, well, I own my own premises, so that's not an issue. But how do you own it? If you own it in your self-managed superannuation fund, do you have an arm's length lease between your business and your super fund? If you own it in a family trust, is there an arm's length transaction or lease between the two different entities. That's something that's particularly important, especially if the tax man comes knocking and decides that he wants to do an audit. And I've already touched on what happens if or when your term expires. Do you have an option to extend your lease for a further period? And if so, on what terms do you do that? Do you have your option date diarised so that you know that by X date, normally six months or so before the end of the lease, I need to tell the landlord in a specific form that I'm going to renew my lease. If I renew my lease, on what terms am I going to renew it? If I'm not going to renew my lease, what do I need to do when I leave? All important things that you need to understand. So get your lease out, 
if you own the premises and you don't have a lease, think about preparing one at arm's length because it's important that you do that. If you don't do that, there are obviously issues for your business in terms of where you can operate from and there are also issues for you if the tax man decides to come knocking and find out why under market rent is being paid, particularly if the landlord is your self-managed superannuation fund. Now supplies is our next step along and supplies aren't necessarily something that will affect everyone to the same degree. But if you were to sit down and write out a list of who your key suppliers are, think about who that would be. Uh, for me, one of my key suppliers who doesn't immediately come to mind, spring to mind is our software provider. Without our software provider and our cloud-based uh, service that we get, our practice would be um, somewhat hamstrung. So write down, and they might not always be obvious, who those key suppliers are that supply things to your business. Now they might not always be goods, uh, they might be different services that are supplied. There might be a, a particular company or organisation that you subcontract work out to. I'd list them in your supplies as well. Do you have more than one? If you don't have more than one, what agreement do you have with the one supplier that you have? And with that one supplier, then what happens if they can't supply a particular good or a particular product to you? So I've just answered my next point there. What agreement, or spoken about my next point there, what agreements do you have in place? What happens if those goods or services that are being supplied by your supplier aren't delivered on time? What happens to you? So if you're in manufacturing, obviously you'll be acutely aware of the fact that you need your materials on time to be able to manufacture the product to get it to your uh, customer and that if you don't get it to the customer, you might be in breach of your own obligations under whatever contract you have to supply them. If you're a restaurateur or involved in any way in the food industry, what happens if all of a sudden where you get your prime cut beef from uh, goes out of business and you can't source that anymore. What does that mean to your business? If you're in the uh, liquor and gaming industry, what happens if all of a sudden there's a particular brand or a particular supplier who is unable to deliver for you? What does that do to your business? The answer might be it doesn't make any difference to me. I'll go to, go to their competitor and if that's what it is, that's fine. But you just need to be aware of what agreements you have in place. Are you actually able to go to the competitor of that person and take, get supplies from them? Or are you in some way restrained from doing that? Or do you have to give a certain period of notice if they fail to supply goods and services, or goods or services on time? Again, get out a piece of paper, write down who your key suppliers are, pull out your agreements and have a look at them. Make sure you understand what is in there because it's when people make uh, knee-jerk decisions when suppliers are unable to deliver on time or they fail to plan for contingencies that might happen in terms of the supplier not being able to supply a particular good or service that problems can arise for that particular business. Talking about your terms of trade and this is how you do business. Are you a cash business, not in the traditional sense of the word, or a credit business? And there's a big difference. If you're a cash business, that means that you get cash on delivery, you take money via a credit card, you get money up front before you do the job. If you're a credit business, you are effectively acting as a bank and you are supplying your goods or services on credit and hoping 
that your customer is going to pay. And they don't always pay. Part of the reason I've started doing this is because a client, good client, came to me and was in trouble because they had supplied and installed a product for a builder to the tune of $150,000. That builder then decided to put the particular client off and put them off and put them off until such time as eventually the client came to see me. There was $150,000 owing and ultimately, despite assurances to the contrary from the builder and from his solicitors, the builder went belly up, filed for bankruptcy and our client stood in line with all the other creditors. That happened over 18 months ago and I still to this day don't think that they've actually seen any money or that the liquidation of that particular building company has actually finalised to the point where dividends are being paid to any of the creditors. So while it's an extreme example, things can get away very, very quickly. If you are supplying on credit and you are a credit business, you need to understand what happens if you don't get paid. And that sounds like an absolutely ridiculous proposition. But think about it. If you have fifty or a hundred thousand dollars outstanding with a particular client, is that something that's acceptable to you? Or is there some way in which you can put a limit in place? What are the consequences of a particular job that you supply the labour or the goods or the services for are not then paying? If that puts your business under then perhaps it's not a job that you want to take on to begin with. To protect yourself if you are a if you are providing your goods and services effectively on credit, you need to have terms and conditions in place. If you can't put your hand on your terms and conditions or you don't know what your terms and conditions are, then I suggest you ring someone reasonably quickly. Your terms and conditions are the terms and conditions upon which other people will do business with you or to probably put it better, that you will agree to provide goods and services or a particular product to a client or customer. They're the terms upon which your business will be engaged by people and you are allowed to set them. If you are providing your goods and services on credit, then I urge you to get personal guarantees from company directors, whoever you need to get them from. If my client that we spoke about before had personal guarantees, then they would have been able to recover the $150,000 or attempt to recover the $150,000 that they owed from the director of that business personally. If a, and my standard response is that if I, uh, I get a question that says, goes along the lines of, nobody will want to sign a personal guarantee. Well, the only people who won't want to sign a personal guarantee is someone that doesn't intend paying you or thinks that they might not be able to pay you. And if they don't want to sign a personal guarantee, the other way that you can still do business with them is to insist on money up front. If they don't want to do either of those two things, then I wonder whether or not they really uh, intend paying you to do the work that you are going to do for them or to pay for the product that you're going to provide. You can't walk into Woolworths and walk out with your groceries and say that you're going to pay them later on. In fact, they don't even give you the option to sign a personal guarantee and take it on credit. And how much money can you spend on bad debts? Litigation is a horrible, horrible thing that costs a lot of money. There's a lot of back and forth, you end up settling for less than you think that you're actually owed. 
and it's it just not a path that you want to go down. So not only have you lost money or you've got money at risk that you're trying to recover, but you've then got to pay a lawyer to try and recover that money for you. The better thing to do would to be to pay the lawyer probably a tenth of what the litigation cost would be and to put terms and conditions in place, have template personal guarantees for people that don't want to pay money up front and to ensure as far as possible that you're able to um, recover any bad debts that you might have uh, quickly and efficiently and where possible eliminate them completely. Now I've got about 19 minutes or so left until 1.30 or 18 minutes left until 1.30. We're not going to go all the way to 1.30. As promised, I'll get you out of here a little bit early. But the last thing that we're going to talk about is your personal um, affairs, your personal legal affairs and how they affect your business. So if you couldn't come to work today, what would have happened? Would your business have continued to operate? Would anyone have picked up the ball and run with it? How would you and your family survive if you were incapacitated for a longer period? What would happen to your family if you passed away? Would your husband or wife or significant other go into business with your business partner? And what would that look like? In most cases, probably an unmitigated disaster. What would happen to your business if you passed away? Would it continue to operate? Would they just wind it up? Is there anyone that could take it on? Could your partner afford to buy people out? And vice versa, what happens if your business partner dies? Are you able to put your business on the market and sell it? Are you able to pay out your business partner's estate? Do you want to go into, bit, into business with your uh, business partner's husband, wife, significant other, children? We see all of these things. What you need to do is look for two documents. The first is your shareholders or partnership agreement. See if you can find what it says about these things. The second document that you need to look for is your will. If you don't have either of those, the minute this webinar is finished, you should be picking up the phone and calling a lawyer. The other document that you may have in your office, although if you don't have the other two, you probably don't, is a buy-sell agreement. You need to create certainty about what will happen if you are critically ill or injured or you pass away, if only to protect your family and to make sure that you don't or your wife or husband or significant other doesn't have to go into business with your business partner and vice versa. As much as you might like them now, you may not like them so much when you're actually in business with them. And if you're not able to pay their interest in the business out, then they, in many cases, can pick up 50% of the profit from that business and do no work for it. Having a properly drawn will, having a properly drawn enduring power of attorney, having your nominations correctly crafted in relation to your superannuation, all for this personal section are all things that need to be looked at. I mean, in each of these areas that we've spoken about today are all areas where an individual webinar of at least an hour could be dedicated to them. 
as I've said, that's not the intention of today. Today, the idea is for you to just have a look, open up your filing cabinet, go back over this webinar which will be posted on our website and see whether or not, see how well organised you actually are, see whether or not you know or can start to identify what these sleepers in your business might be. Um, talk to someone about the most important things to you in your business. doesn't have to be a lawyer. could be your wife or your husband or your children or whoever when you get home tonight. It might be your office manager. It might be one of your empl trusted employees. I've got a note there that says that you know, the first 10 people who email me will get a free 30-minute business health check assessment. Anyone who sees this webinar, including those who might view it online, if you email me and you want your own business health check assessment and you send me an email, I'll send you the survey. So that will hopefully assist you and guide you through looking through the documents that you've already got in place. That should then form the basis upon which you go and speak to um, us, preferably your own lawyer, um, perhaps your accountant in relation to some issues, but you have a general look and run a ruler over your business just to see where the big issues might lie for you. I encourage you all to do that at some point sooner rather than later. I know that it's particularly busy at this time of year, coming into Christmas and only a number of days or weeks really left. But even if it's not something that you do before Christmas, everybody's normally a little bit slower in January. So take the time, take a couple of hours if you need that long, pull the documents out and have a think about what has been spoken about in this webinar and be proactive about your business and protecting it. If you want Alice to help you be proactive in relation to your business and protecting it, then we're more than willing to be. Uh, our contact details are there on the last slide. I'd like, you to, like to thank you all for attending the webinar today. Those that have clicked on this as a recording on our website, I'd like to thank you for your interest as well, particularly if you've stayed through the webinar right to the end. Thanks very much for listening.